that. Why don't you talk about your background, Diane? Um, well, first, I'd just like to say thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled, and I can't believe how many people are here. And um, as you all introduced yourself, I could get a chill, you know, um, and, and come to tears just about. I'm delighted to speak tonight. I'm delighted to be working for Gifts of Life. Um, I've been working in transplant for almost, well, almost 19 years. Um, yesterday, Howard introduced me and said, oh, she has well over 20 years of transplant history. And I thought, yeah, I was a child prodigy. But uh, mm -hmm. anyway, I've been working in transplant for a long time. Started out as a nurse at the bedside in Hahnemann and um, worked my way up as a coordinator. And then I went to Robert Wood Johnson in New Jersey and started the kidney program, kidney pancreas program there on top of the hospital. Um, I was there for 10 years and was administrator of the program when I left in January. Um, because I wasn't taking care of patients anymore. Was part of it. You know, I was doing all of the administrative and the finance and the regulatory and, the, um, and saw that this position had come up and that this new, we were doing new things in transplant. So uh, I decided to come here and get back to follow up and get back to working with patients. And, and in with the real deal. So with that, I can start. Um, Pam, do you turn down those floodlights on the side? So when they brought me in, there, there was a question, you know, this is kind of the okay. first time and there are only a few programs in the country right now that have um, people working in the OPOs, the Urban Procurement Organizations that are working on the clinical side of this and working with living donation. Um, and a lot of roads have led to this point. Um, and again, I'm delighted to be here. A lot of people have questioned, you know, well, what's gift of life doing with the living donors and even some of, with the living donors and even some of the transplant centers. And the thing is that we are here because the mission of this program and the mission of transplant across the country has always been to increase donation, to facilitate transplant, and to make more transplant transplants happen in the country. So with that said, you know, I always like to put this slide up. It's from one of the first presentations that I ever did 10 years ago. Um, and it's still true today. So there are several treatment options for, for chronic kidney disease, but for patients who suffer from renal failure, but none that offers more of a promise for a return to a normal life than kidney transplantation. Transplant is the treatment of choice for most, if not all, patients who suffer from chronic renal failure. And that hasn't been a known fact for a very long time. It was just in 2000 was the first time that a study was able to show that patients not only reported a better quality of life with a kidney transplant, but we were able to prove that patients were going to live longer if they had a kidney transplant if they stayed on dialysis. And a successful kidney transplant at any age offers greater enhancement in the quality and duration of life and is more effective medically and economically than chronic dialysis therapy. Um, these are the most recent numbers that are put out at the website, and it's astounding to me as I update these slides. I've been here at Life for a few months. So as of July, there are 85,000 people waiting for kidneys. Now, they're registrations, um, and those numbers mean that some of patients can be on two lists in more than one OPO. <coughs> so some of them, it doesn't always mean that there are that many patients, but there are that many people registered for kidneys to be donated. For those of you here, especially, I'm... I'm we've got the heart recipients that are here. Congratulations for the longevity that you have had your organs. Um, and livers, 16,000 people waiting for livers, 2850 for hearts, 1900 for lungs. Um, heart lung 81 and test 230. So 110,650 people waiting for organs in the United States as of July 10th. Here are those numbers broken down. Now we're part of um, UNOS breaks the country down into regions. We are part of region two. That includes Pennsylvania, Delaware, and parts of southern New Jersey. Um, to break that list down further, it's 11,600 people waiting for kidneys in our region. Um, 2196 lovers, you can see the numbers there. 352 for kidney pancreas, 361, and 14 for heart and lung. So this is the waiting list by Oregon, and this is a, a slide that they show a lot. Um, there have been a, the transplant collaboratives that CURSA started in 2002 and, and a lot of these slides have been shown over and over again and they add them. The thing is that the transplant list have been getting smaller for all most of the, all of the organs. This is heart, lung, um, lung, heart. And part of that you'll see in 2005 the numbers started to go down. 
maybe certainly for a good cause, maybe for not. But at that point, I think was when finally people stepped in, the transplant community stepped in and said, okay, we need to look at what we're doing. We need to make sure that we're doing a good thing by transplanting all the patients that we are transplanting. And we need to look at this scarce resource that we have available and make sure that the patients that we are giving these organs to are really doing well. So at that point, especially for patients that received lungs, the lung list, and the heart list, they tightened up some of the restrictions for the people that were waiting or the patients that were eligible. But there's no kidney list. It never slowed. It's not going to stop. It keeps getting bigger and bigger. And the liver list pretty much has plateaued a little bit, but it's still growing. So this is experience over the past 15 years here at Gift of Life Donor Program. And you can see the green line at the bottom are the number of patients that have received transplants. Um, through the hospitals in our OPO. So in 2008, 1367, 1367 um, transplants were performed, but it's kind of chasing our tails because the list has grown and there's 5,900 people waiting. And this just breaks it down. What I did is I went through, we have, just for our gift of life donor service area, we have 15 transplant centers. So I went through the numbers that are reported from the government and they're accessible to anyone on the um, internet and counted the patients just for our 15 centers and excluded um, the outside centers like Pittsburgh and, and the other, just for our gift of life donor area. So at the end of 2008, there were 4,700 patients waiting for kidneys. In all of 2008, 2,092 patients were registered on kidney lists, and this is just kidney alone, within our 15 hospitals. 1,646 patients were removed. So that was, that was removed for all reasons. Could have been because they, they died while they were waiting on the list, because they received an organ, because they received an organ, organ in a different transplant center. But the bottom line is that there was an, an overall growth of 446 patients on the kidney transplant list, which was 9.5%. Well, if you look at those numbers, it must be done. Don't tell me something. That 9.5% growth, if you look at the National Kidney Transplant List, as of 2007, they estimate that about 4,000 people a year are added to the National Kidney Transplant Waiting List. So it grows by about 4.5 or less than 5% every year. Here in our Gift of Life area, we're growing at twice the rate mm. as the, the general list is for the rest of the country. So you can see the numbers down there. The yellow lines show the number of patients that are currently on the transplant. They're the transplant centers at the bottom. I'm sorry. They're the codes. Um, every transplant center has a, a hospital code, as you know. So the PA, of course, is all Pennsylvania. Um, the 1,300, you can use that as a reference. You pay a tough University of Pennsylvania. Um, Hi, uh, the gift of life here is, as an organization is one of the, if not the best in the country. How do you explain the fact that we're behind? I mean, our growth rate in people waiting, you said is double that on the national list. How do you explain that? So we're not behind. We're not behind in transplants performed. We're listing. We have even more people in our area that mm -hmm. need kidneys than those in the rest mm -hmm. of the country. What does that mean? Well, there are a lot of transplant centers in our area, but it means that we're listing patients faster. It means that it's it's still somewhat subjective. There are We're listing them faster than other parts of the country. Just listing them. Well, my personal opinion, coming from New Jersey, mm -hmm. you have a lot of people coming from outside of the area of Philadelphia to get put on on transplant list, even mm -hmm. in this area, because these transplant centers. I mean, you know, this room is living proof of that. That patients do well. Um, Part of the reason is, if you look at centers that are closed, so I was in New Jersey. I wish I had a map, I don't have. So I worked in New Jersey, and the rules for UNO say that you can be on more than one transplant waiting list, mm -hmm. but in separate OPOs, which is organ procurement organizations. Mm -hmm. So um, the not in separate regions, but in separate OPOs. So the way that it's set <coughs> up is you can be in New Jersey, the New Jersey Sharing Network, is the organ procurement organization. It just so happens they cover the whole state. Just like here, Gift of Life, we cover part of Delaware and all the mm -hmm. city here, some of the regional Harrisburg. Um, the wait time in Philadelphia in the Gift of Life OPO is less than the waiting time in the sharing network. 
So we had a patient come to our center in New Jersey, and they were on the list at Hopper. They were getting on the list at University of Pennsylvania or any of the other 13 centers here or 14 centers in, in, in Philadelphia in the Gift of Life area. And they were listing in New Jersey. The chances were that they were going to, if they didn't have a living donor, they were going to receive a kidney sooner in Philadelphia because the Gift of Life does so well um, with their organ donor rate. With their deceased donor. Hmm. Um, and just to clarify something you said, you said Sherry Network covers all of New Jersey. You didn't mean that, right? Because Gift of Life covers southern New Jersey. Yes, it covers, yeah. Um, <coughs> is Lord's Sorry. part of Sherry Network? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's interesting, just a quick personal story. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I was, I apparently didn't realize it was on two different lists. I mean, I registered at Lord's for my kidney. I also registered at University of Pennsylvania. Right. Right. I didn't know Lord's was a separate. Yeah. I didn't hear from Lourdes. I got four or five opportunities from that. Just interesting. Mm -hmm. So Lourdes as a transplant center, they receive their organs. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, it uh, happens a couple places across the country. Lourdes receives their organs through the New Jersey Sharing Network. Mm -hmm. The Sharing Network is in charge of distributing the organs mm -hmm. to Lourdes. However, the hospitals in the southern part of New Jersey who have deceased donors or where their families want to donate their organs, gift of life is in, the, in charge of the procurement. Mm -hmm. Sharing Network and Cooper has Lourdes and Cooper. Um, the sharing life that one has covers some more than Cooper. Right, the Gift of yeah. Life has the, what's the most southern hospitals? Cumberland um, County, the new hospital, Delta, is it? There's a couple of them. Shore Memorial, all that. I don't think they have, I don't think they have Shore. I think it's just those very most southern, most southern down mm here. -hmm. They have those hospitals. That's Trump. It's a small part of mm -hmm. New Jersey. And I apologize because I was on the private of New Jersey and Cooper representatives from Cooper's trauma. Mm -hmm. They were there, Dr. Cook. <coughs> My son recovered was a Cooper, and that was a sharing network. Correct. Tom's years ago was at Cooper, and that was the gift of life. So it changed somewhere in the middle. Gift of life is growing in the county itself. Right. <coughs> sharing network is most of the for the most of the more than such for the two hospitals in the end of the Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> So, I lost my train of thought, but we'll go back. Here's the list. What you'll see included in here and in some of these slides, I didn't include, there are three pediatric transplant centers in our OPO. So, we have um, St. Chris's, we have CHOP, and we have um, DuPont down in Delaware. So, they're the ones that are now um, basically, luckily with the kids, if they do two or three transplants a year, that's that's a lot, you know, so that's why those centers look like they're so small. So there's really 12 centers that, that take care of results. So with that said, there's also other areas of the government that follow statistics and um, take care of patients or regulate the care that patients receive, um, that particularly Medicare recipients receive. So the U U U.S. renal data system is um, the other side of the government of Medicare, CMS, that takes care of patients that are on dialysis or the renal disease patients that are not on the transplant side of things. So in other words, these are numbers that are taken not from the transplant <coughs> centers but from the other side of, of, of the government care just to show that these numbers really are, are true. So as of December 31st of 06, and again, the numbers are always like behind because by the time they get all the totals in, we're always at least a year or two years behind. But the number of patients that are receiving end-stage renal disease treatment, end-stage is not patients who have kidneys that are failing. That's patients who are on dialysis or have been on dialysis of some type or have had a transplant, 506,000. Patients on dialysis were 355, so that means, you know, in addition to patients that were living with transplants. Patients that were living with a functioning kidney transplant were over 150,000 in the United States. So that was another one of the reasons that the government stepped in and said, you know what, we need to learn how to take care of these patients everywhere in the country, not just at the transplant centers. Um, new dialysis and transplant patients initiating therapy in 2006 alone were almost 111,000. Um, deaths reported from end state renal disease were 87, and projected numbers for the ESRD population in 2020 are up to 784,000 people. Well, here are some other 
very discouraging statistics that I thought you know we would we would take a look at. Here's the median age of the prevalent ESRD population is 58.8 years old. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I think that's young, <laughs> and it's getting younger all the time. The older I get, the median age of new patients who start end-stage renal disease therapy, so that's patients whose kidneys where they need renal replacement therapy, is 64.4 years. The average lifespan on, di on dialysis. So for patients who are aged 40 to 44, and that's young, who start dialysis within that age group, have an average lifespan of eight years. So that means that they're really only going to live to 48 years old, to so 54 years old. Patients who start dialysis between the ages of 60 and 64, and this is really what changes things, have an average lifespan of 4.5 years if they start dialysis at that age group. So patients who initiate end-stage renal disease therapy with a transplant, who don't have to go on dialysis at all, who need renal replacement therapy, whose kidneys have failed and need replacement, they start with a transplant. They're 2.3 times more likely to survive that five years than on any type of dialysis they can deliver. Well, when you look at this, these are statistics, and I just updated them, as of July 10th that are reported in the National Data Bank and in the Unix Data Bank. These are the average waiting times. So for kidneys, the average waiting time, and this is in the country, I couldn't calculate, it's very difficult to calculate, but to calculate for our center alone was too hard. It's over five years. Well, if the waiting time for a deceased donor kidney is over five years, then those patients who are getting on dialysis mm -hmm. when they turn 60, they're not gonna make it. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna make it because that average waiting time is over five years. So these numbers are what really made us study and the government say, what are we gonna do? We need to do something for these patients and we need to help stop patients that are dying on the list for all organs, but kidneys for this program. So you look at this data, and this is the donor trends in, in the country. So the yellow line are the deceased donors, and you can see, I don't have my pointer, pointer but in like 03, um, 02 was when the first collaborative started, when HRSA stepped in, the government stepped in. Um, Tommy Thompson was um, the health secretary and came in and announced his clause was going to be to prevent death from waiting list was a wonderful thing. I had friends who were at that meeting that he came as a surprise when he announced that the Secret Service men came in first. Um, and he really did a great thing. I worked at a transplant hospital and they sent this letter out to hospitals that weren't performing as donor hospitals, okay? And they sent a letter out, and it was signed by Tommy Thompson, and it more or less said, we're gonna start this program, and, and our goal is that patients are not gonna die waiting for organs in this country. And we've done a study of the major hospitals across the country, and we found 150 hospitals that are not performing up to par that where you are in front of the statistics, you should have more organ donors coming from your institution. So we would like representatives from your hospital, and they named like five positions that they wanted. And it said, um, more or less, we're sure you'll cooperate and you will participate in sending these people, if not call us. In other words, they weren't paying for it and they weren't, they were telling the hospital you're gonna be involved with call. So they started these collaboratives and wonderful things happened. They increased the organ donor rate, they increased the conversion rate, which was the um, organs that were able to be used from every person that was deceased and they donated. Um, and great things happened. But the sad thing is when it got up to about 8,000 in, in 2007, the reality is that we are probably very close to the number of deceased donors that can donate their organs. Um, if you roll out for many of the other issues of age and other problems that deceased donor patients have had and, and for all other restrictions and all, we're, we're probably pretty close to the top of how many organ donors that we're really going to be able to find. Um, but what was catastrophic here is the living donors. Look how they've gone down. Well, in about 2002, where it went from 5,800 to 65, was where they came up with the laparoscopic donor and the um, And I don't know if you were able to donate laparoscopically. No, I had a no, donation. Did you? Okay. Well, oh, I was it's still a big procedure. I'm the first one to No, it was easier operation. than having a child. It really was. I was in the hospital <laughs> Tuesday out, Thursday, Friday, and I was at my son's restaurant match on Tuesday. Yes, yeah, see, I mean, it really I had no uh, pain. I was amazing. I was housework. Everything it was just like nothing happened. Yeah, I mean, it really was prior to that. 
you know, when they removed your kidney, when I worked as a nurse on the transplant unit, taking care of the donors was difficult sometimes. Well, it was difficult. It was difficult. It was difficult for the donors. Because they had made major incision, and a lot of times they had to remove that bottom rib. So, you know, patients or people, when they have broken ribs, well, they had to remove the rib on top of it. And that incision, you know, as a rule, incisions that are higher up on your body are more painful. You couldn't get them out of bed. You couldn't sit them up to eat. You couldn't get them to walk. You can't do anything without moving your torso. You know, it was really so. It made a significant difference. It really did. And the numbers went up as high as almost 7,000 in the state 2004. And then they started to come down again. Um, and maybe, maybe there were some centers that were taking some kidneys from donors that maybe shouldn't have, you know, because there weren't really these standard guidelines that said donors. Yeah. I'm <coughs> shocked that the number of living donors has gone down. From everything that I've heard, the number of living donors has gone up. I mean, I, I, I doubt it to the point where I, like, I don't believe your slide. It, it goes against everything that I've heard. There's a, yeah, there's a website. If you go to the UNO's website, you can go to data. But there's another website, the SRTR, and that gives every transplant center in the country their statistics, the numbers of the people on the list, and the number of, of um, donors. So, well, these are the, the 2008 donors. And believe it or not, for right now, for 09, there are a lot of numbers are down. They're down. Okay. I'm really, really sure. Yeah. The good news is it's because you're hearing a lot about it because of our program. We want to get to that goal. Yes. Diane, did you say that we're, for some reason, maxed out on the number of deceased organ donors we could receive? Not maxed out, but, but um, there are a few numbers. studies that report that we may be not too far. Not every person who, every deceased donor is... Um, Right. You know, that they can take their organs and yeah. if they have a, a viral disease or if they die from trauma and there's trauma to the organs or that's against the, the current age. base of well, correct. contributors. But if we correct increase the So when you look at how many true organ donors that there there are that the organs are gonna last and there mm -hmm. there may not be that many more than eight thousand. Well we can get that a lot higher. But there are different studies. If we get Presumed consent. More donors. If we get presumed consent, yes. You know, if we, yes, definitely. There I don't want to walk we having people think that that's it, we're done. No, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't know what's going on. The other thing that we've heard a lot of is of those approach, of the 1% who can be organ donors, only half say yes. So there seems to be a 50% opportunity still waiting, right? <laughs> The number seems to be a lot. I'm talking about 12. But my last thing that I looked was around 12,000 a year. It doesn't seem to be changing. Yeah, but of but those, the 12,000 is what? Able to donate yeah. or saying yes? We're getting 8 out of the 12. Mm -hmm. You think we're getting 80% a consent rate? No, we're getting 8,000 8, out of 12,000. 75 percent. 75 percent. 8 are able out of the 12 that consent? 75 percent. No, that's not 75 percent. 8 out of 12? 60, right. Points to 67%. Around 70% is the, is the consent rate. Today. Below so, 70% today. I guess, well, the point is that the 30% opportunity is still yeah, sitting out there absolutely. versus mm -hmm. this max that's idea, right? Good. Okay. That's all we're trying to bring out. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work to be done in educating people and getting them to say yes. Absolutely. You know, and the donor, um, the registries now, the driver's license registries and all that, they're really starting to sign up a lot of people. Um, the New Jersey registry just came online, so more donors are signing up mm -hmm. there. So as far as the living donors, um, UNOS has stepped in or, or did step in, and, and there are now guidelines, and they're not rules, but they're guidelines about who is a good kidney donor and who's not a kidney donor, and who, um, you know, there have been some safeguards set in, and, and we're back to looking at these living donors and what happened to these people. Well, part of the key with their increasing the number of living donors, and I'll show it in the next couple of slides. Anyway, this, and I love this slide, but so we're going back to the living donor pool. Anyway, you know, this is Dr. Joseph Murray, and these are the twins, the first living donor kidney transplant in the country. Um, and this is Richard and Ronald Herrick and their nurse. This is Dr. Joe Murray. He performed the first transplant of the Brigham and Women's in 1954. So when I was doing my, in grad school and doing my um, <coughs> work, I had to do a paper and I did a lot of papers on transplant, but I did a paper on this and um, he was a really neat guy. It was the first time in history 
that anyone was performing an operation on someone who would receive absolutely no benefit from it. So even if you go in for elective surgery and you have plastic surgery and you have your eyes fixed or if you have a breast implant or if you have, you're, you're going into that even though you don't have to have it, you're going to come out with some benefit. And being a kidney donor was the first time that someone was going to be coming, going through an operation and receiving no physical benefit from it except for you know, the emotional benefit of helping someone out. He went to a ton of people. Um, he actually wrote some papers, but he went to a few rabbis for advice. He went to different church groups. He went to political groups. He went to support groups um, to just see how there, what the different perspectives were on it. And um, these brothers never wavered. The funny thing is that when I was here on orientation, I've been working in, in transplant a long time. Howard was doing orientation, and he had this picture on the slide. And he said, you know, that was their nurse, and he married her, I think, in the end. So I had to look it up, and he did. And I said, look at that picture. You can tell. They fell in love there. They're smitten. Um, actually, I read the story. She was the head nurse in the operating room, mm -hmm. and she was moved to Boston to work at Brigham and Women's. And she worked overtime because it was actually a holiday weekend. It was Christmas weekend that they did the transplant. And she did private duty on the recipient, Richard. And they actually married shortly after the transplant. But that's the donor brother on the right. That's Ronald. And here he is in 2004. So, you know, for some of the transplant centers, and sometimes you'll hear stories that donated a kidney and they were depressed or they were going to do another stuff and they had it open or they had it. You know, this was him. And, and for those of you from University of Pennsylvania, that's Dr. Avi Shaket, and um, that's Dr. Bannett. And Dr. Joe Martin was supposed to receive an award. That was the transplant meeting. That was the 50th anniversary. And I really went because I wanted to see him get the award. And he was sick. He didn't make it that night. But I did recently see a picture of him. He is still alive. And this was at the transplant games. Um, the donor brother, Ronald, is actually a teacher in Maine. Um, and he's still doing well. So, And that's Howard. Everybody knows Howard. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, Howard, is he on like any blood pressure medication? Is he on Howard? Because I don't know. I didn't ask that. I said it would have been the first thing out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> are you okay or are you? So, um, you know, it, it's a wonderful thing. Dr. Murray did receive a Nobel Prize in 1997. He was acknowledged for this. And this event <coughs> took place in 1954. <coughs> so when he went with that, we're going back to the living donor pool. And I, I love that story, Dr. Murray. But this was... Um, this is from the SRTR, and that's the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients. And they do an annual report, and it is available. They, they do the statistics for U.S. And this is what they wrote in their summary of the annual report of 2007. As members of the professional transplant community, it's our responsibility to our patients and to society, so this is to the transplant professionals, to find innovative ways to increase the number of life-saving transplants performed, facilitating living donations and subsequent vial option for kidney candidates. So I'd like to see that it is our responsibility to our patients. Um, and many things are, are really happening. So I took this article from the US News, and I don't know if anyone saw it, where the woman donated the kidney to her belly button. Um, there was also another case that they removed the kidney vaginally from a donor somewhere, I don't know, like delivering a baby. Um, I don't know that we're all ready for that yet. But I do think that there are some initiatives going. The National Kidney Foundation declared in Jan January of this year that they are now taking on transplant um, as their major cause. They, it's called the End the Wait Initiative. And they've already been part of a bill that's been introduced to Congress. And it's the closest that they've ever been to get immunosuppressing drugs covered for life for all transplant recipients mm -hmm. and for any organ donors, living organ donors, that will be covered for, with insurance. Medicare will cover any problems related to that donation for life. And it will also stop um, commercial insurance companies from being able to hold an organ donor as that being a pre-existing condition. And that's really a big issue. Um, so these were the transplants performed by donor type. So I came here and, and one of the surgeons that we met with early on said, you know, we're just not going to have the same number of living donors in our area as other areas across the country. You know, we're, we're an urban community and, you know, there are certain transplant centers that are never going to have more living donors. Well, if you look at the numbers, I disagree. I think that's wrong. So nationally in 08, there were 16,500 transplants performed. Of that across the country, 10,550 were deceased donors and there were 5,900 living donors. 
So if it's 64% and 36%, our numbers here, are just in our donor service area, are 15 hospitals when you add up the numbers. Um, there were 574 deceased donor kidney transplants that took place here, but only 200 <coughs> living donors. That's a big discrepancy, the 27% to the 36%. So I think it's still an untapped source out there in our area. So we may have to go out and beat the bushes and shake the trees, and, but there are donors out there, so hopefully we can move things, get things moving. So where do we go? Well, kidney pair donation. These kidney pair donations have been around for a while. And there are some beliefs, and I'll show you some of the numbers that come up next, but some beliefs in the kidney pair donation, because the reality is we don't know how many people are out there that are willing to donate a kidney. But they feel that there's probably at least one in five, 20% of patients who are placed on a waiting list for a kidney probably have potential donors that are incompatible, people that are willing to donate, that are blood type or cross-matching compatible because the recipients have antibodies and their kidneys are not um, compatible with them. There are different programs that have different estimates, but for sure, and there are statistics that now show that it's probably a little over 2,000 additional kidney transplants can be performed per year through these kidney pair donation programs. Statistics show that living donor kidneys generally last twice as long as deceased donor kidneys. And why that is so important in this program right now and for anyone that receives a deceased donor kidney, it will help in patients losing, um, not losing their kidneys and requiring a retransplant. So in other words, many patients who receive a deceased donor kidney are retransplanted in 10 years or however long those kidneys last. We can get them to have living donor kidneys and the average lifetime of a living donor kidney is 20 years and that will leave many, many more kidneys for those patients who are waiting on the list that don't have living donors. And there are many people out there that don't. Um, Diane, and why is that? Is it because the kidney is fresher? Or, I mean, from a living donor versus a deceased? Yes. It's it just an awesome thing when you see it in the operating room because when they do a living donor transplant and um, Sometimes they'll follow each other, but any that I've seen, they're in adjoining the rooms. They're the hallway that's there all in mm -hmm. So the, they start to get the kidney out, and when they, the laparoscopic surgeries fluctuate, you know, they can't say exactly what time they're going to get it out. But when they get close enough, then they bring the recipient in the room next door, and the recipient the surgeon gets the recipient ready and does the first incision, and he's ready. So that when the, can, the kidney is handed off from him, they're ready to just put it in. Yeah, I mean, the, re the reperfusion of it is a lot quicker, I do love kidney transplants. Um, and it, it's right there rather than having to be transported from somewhere else. And waiting 24, 40 hours. Well, that's yeah. called cold ischemia time. Cold ischemia time is the time that it's clamped from the donor, whomever that donor may mm -hmm. be, clamped from blood flow. So there's no blood going to that kidney right now. Mm -hmm. Taken out, if it's a deceased donor, it's stored in the frozen solution for up to 24 hours or so cold ischemia time is the time that it's clamped from the donor to the mm -hmm. time that it is in the recipient that it's going to and unclamped that blood flows to it again. Mm -hmm. When you do a living donor transplant, a cold ischemia time is less than one hour. Mm -hmm. Those kidneys, and when I was in the operating room, and, um, you know, I certainly don't have the opportunity to go in all the time, Diana has been in. I mean, when I was in there, you'll see when they hook it up, the kidney's making urine right there on the table. The surgeon was sewing. Hmm. And he said, oh, I knew. And I said, what? And he said, it's urine. It's pain. Mm -hmm. You know, the kidney is making urine before they can even get it sewed in. Mm -hmm. What happens with the deceased donor kidneys is when they take it out, there's a little bit of shock that goes on there um, when they put it in the, the stored solution. Um, and then the match and, and trying to get all the blood work done and get everything done. It takes time for those kidneys pretty much to warm up. Sometimes they don't come back at 100% of their mm -hmm. function. There's always a little bit of like shock that goes to it with the time that it's out. And then, you know, we know that the kidneys are going to match from the living donors. Part of the reason with the living donor that there's more success than the deceased donor is with the living donor transplant, kidney transplants, you schedule the surgery. The surgeries are scheduled. They're not happening at 2 o'clock in the morning when you're calling someone in who may be didn't have a great dialysis treatment for the past week because the rat's not functioning right. Or may just be getting over an infection or, you know, when we plan the living donor surgeries, you know that we're going to do it when the recipient is in their optimum health and the donor is in their optimum health. And we know when we work up the living donors, they're given the best physical that they would probably have under any other circumstance. 
to make sure that their kidneys are at 100% and that you know we're not going to do any harm to the living donors when we take a kidney. Hmm. Even in a living donor, if you do a study, if, if they have the last testing done, and you see that you know your kidneys aren't always 50-50. You know, one might do 70% of the work and one does 30% or one does 60-40. They always take the smaller one, the, the, the less functioning one, for transplant. You really only need 30% of the kidney to function. 30% of the kidney function to live. So for both of For well, for total kidney function. So when you do patients that um, when you do your 24-hour ones, um, when you do and and they talk about your GFR rate, uh, the percentage if they say your kidneys are functioning at 20% or so. That's combined with both your kidneys, not that. Um, we don't activate people on the waiting list until they're at 20% of kidney function. Most patients get to about 10% of kidney function that they have to go on dialysis. Okay? So you can live with 30%. It's not great, it's not 100%, but you can live at 30% if you're gonna, you know, that kidney doesn't have to function. So, but when you're getting a living donor kidney, you know that you're getting the best kidney there. Right? Hmm. Did you say you can you go on the waiting list when you're at ten percent? You can go on the waiting list at any number for a zero mismatch kidney. Which means if there's a say if you're not on dialysis yet and your kidney your function is at twenty five percent or you can go on the list, but your name will only come up if there's an exact match for you somewhere in the country. At 20% or less, you get activated to start a growing waiting time where you'll just come up for kidneys that you're oh. even close to, not a zero So 10% function, you don't have an exact match? No, no, no. no? Greater than 20% function. Greater than 20, you just get an exact match. At 20, you get activated. Yep. At 10, most patients need to be on dialysis. Right. Desperate. Yeah. Thank you. And it's then you can get a kidney yeah. at any time from there. I was surprised to see, I had spent some time up in New England, at New England Oregon Bank in Boston, and up there, they're not allowed to be activated on the kidney transplant waiting list until you start dialysis. Really? Yeah. Hmm. It's not, every, every OPO is different? It's one OPO, so it's all of New England, there's 14 transplants. It's not a national yeah. rule. Yeah, it's not a national rule, no. You know, so that's where a lot of these regulations came in, and, and we're starting to really make things a little more uniform across the country. Altruistic donors are a wonderful thing. I think if people want to come forward and do this, it's great. But I think that the living donors will still have the ability to do those even swaps. Um, you know, there are no guarantees, except if we can say that we're going to pay for immunosuppression drugs for life, you know, that would be one step. Because the, the truth of the matter is, just not looking at the articles and the statistics from working in transplant for this many years. I've seen patients do it in, in the clinic and in patients who were doing fine and then all of a sudden they'll come in because you only see them like two or three times a year and all of a sudden their, their drug levels are low. You know, how come? Well, you know, even patients who, you know, we had one in New Jersey that was in the newspaper, he was stealing cars and he came back in. I said, what's going on? He said, well, I was taking my medicine twice a week because I knew I didn't have to So he was trying to spread it out, you know, what was going on. So even if people have the best intention, you know, and, and something happened. The problem was it was a Medicaid glitch. You know, when we looked into it, we were able to get his meds restored. But the truth is, most patients stop taking their medication because it's difficult, it's expensive, it's very hard, you know, after your Medicare benefits run out, especially for younger patients. And the kids, all bets are off, they all stop taking their meds. <laughs> Dr. Lascal and I work with the only thing worse than a teenage boy being transplanted is a teenage girl. So, you know, they don't. They get fat, mm -hmm. they get pimples, they get, you know, they don't want to take their medicine, they don't want to stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how's that? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Exchange, or are they already involved? Um, I can tell you that right now, if I had to guess standing here right now, I think they're all going to be involved. They're all so, going to be yes. involved. I think so that they're they're all very interested and they all want to do what's best. Right now, the University of Pennsylvania is enrolled with um, at least one of these national programs. 
Harrisburg Hospital. Uh, Hershey? Uh, no, Harrisburg. Harrisburg. Actually, Hershey is involved also. So Harrisburg is already um, involved. Har Harrisburg, Hershey, Hub. How about Temple? Since you mentioned Dr. Dahl. Temple is already enrolled. Um, I'm trying to think there's another one that I was yeah. Jefferson, or they don't have a program. I don't know if Jefferson is. They're 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 ready. Well, they just they just added another doctor. Yeah, they just added another doctor, and they're ready to. Yeah, I have my at the every year Jefferson gives a luncheon for living donors, and they had the two. They had two altruistic donors that went to luncheon, which I thought was pretty fascinating. Right, because nurse centers are doing that. They are because they're saying that, that people don't want to come to Well, Diana, if you ever need a uh, spokesperson for a living donor, this young lady right there. Right. The way she's experienced yeah, it. Yeah, excellent. That's one thing I, I was just, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to come because it just seems to me that a lot of people are fearful of that procedure mm -hmm. and they look at me kind of strange that <laughs> like wow you did something like that and when I explained to them how simple it was and I had no no problems or you know was in and out of the hospital and you know most people I know have someone that's on dialysis especially in the African American community is a lot of them and I kind of it's helpful to them for me to talk to them because they may be considering doing that when they see how well I'm doing and it gives them some kind of encouragement to go forth then with that procedure. You know, there have been studies done on um, people that have donated kidneys, and, and um, at one point there's a belief that it could be up to as many as 1 in 17 people are, on, are born with only one kidney. And they have no idea what the exact number is because people don't know. They never know. Like I know many years ago, my grandfather had an he only had one kidney. I saw, as a nurse at Hahnemann, um, the daughter of a patient who got a kidney from a son-in-law, she brought in an ultrasound report from when she was pregnant, and at the bottom it said again, of note, there is the absence of a right kidney. Mm -hmm. She only had one kidney, she didn't even know it. They found it on the ultrasound from the baby. You no, know, mm -hmm. you can certainly live a full life with one kidney. Sometimes they they're know. like mm -hmm. really small to the non function Right, right. You know, where's your kidneys, that whole thing, you can't use it. Um, and then there was another study, which was a significant study from World War II. And what they did is they went back and they looked at, at um, soldiers who lost a kidney in World War II from trauma. And they compared them to like patients. So that they were like in ethnicity and age and where they, you know, the, whether they grew up in the city or they grew up on a farm in Idaho and they looked at like, like patients and there was no difference of those that lost the kidney due to trauma or those that had both kidneys at the same age compared to who was had high blood pressure or who had, um, you know, certainly most transplant centers, if you're going to donate, they're going to ask you to, in, you know, amend your lifestyle or to exercise or keep your weight down, you know. Whether that happens, I don't know, but I think that sometimes I've seen donors like that have looked at life a different way. I think the norm is you're donating to a relative. It's not altruistic. It's not that. Mm -hmm. I think more people who are like, why? I mean, I told you Dr. Frank said to me. Right. Said, well, right. Um, so, I mean, but it's me, it's something that's a need, and I know I could do it one Well, you know, in some donors, a lot, I don't know what the percentage is, but kidney donors will get depressed after surgery, and part of that is they don't know what the there's this big buildup, you know, of the transplant center to treat the living donors. Like, you work around their schedule and you get their testing done and they're doing it. And then all of a sudden, like, the focus has changed mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. on the recipient, you know, mm -hmm. they have to come to clinic twice a week and they have to come in and they send the donor home and you see them once or twice in the transplant center. And, you know, then they go home and they're not working and they don't feel so good and they did this to themselves. And, you know, most of the time they have gas and they can't poop and they're not hungry and they're, you know, like that, just <laughs> ugh, miserable, you know. For a couple of days, and I would bet you that most donors, if you catch them after they go home from the hospital, they say, well, you know, and then like, by two weeks or three weeks, it's like, oh, well, thank God I didn't have any problems whatever. I was just really amazed. 
I was going to say balance it out. There's another saying the same thing. Living donors are women that are donating to their husband. Right. And and I, I, she had none of that. I had absolutely no problems post-op. I went back to work in three weeks. And no problems at all. I had no depression. I had no physical problems whatsoever. The impression I made. felt great emotionally that I have mm -hmm. given life to somebody else. And it's a different feeling of living life than you do when you're pregnant and give birth to a child. But you have actually sacrificed a part of yourself to help another human being. And that is a tremendous feeling that I don't think you can compare with anything else in life. Sue, so were you laparoscopic? No. I was going to say, yours was too long. I was, I was an open nephrectomy. Yeah. She did laparoscopic, yeah. So. Maybe, <laughs> maybe Diane. The sons want to do it too. Yeah, our sons well, match yeah. also. Maybe the impression of all those problems is because the only people who would complain are those that have those complaints. These people don't say, "Oh, by the way, I didn't have any problems." Mm -hmm. All you hear is the complainers, of course. So it may give you the impression that the average is, when in fact it's not. I don't know. You know, when I worked at home, and every year they had a um, holiday party, <coughs> and when when. Our daughter, who donated to Bob, works in the operating room at HUP. She's a surgical technician. So she assists many times on transplants, mm -hmm. living donors and, uh, you know, cadaveric transplants. So she assists the surgeons that do the operations. So she knew exactly what she right. was getting into because she's right in there with them. Right. And uh, Dr. Naji, I don't know if you know Dr. Naji at yes. he did Bob's transplant. He absolutely loves our daughter. That she, he says to her, you're my little angel. <laughs> and he is a very wonderful, dedicated surgeon. He caresses the kidney like it's a baby. He's the best. He is the best. And he just loves Laura. And he, you know, he always hugs her and kisses her. And, well, you know, that's a part of like a big problem, and I don't really see it as a problem, but it is the one of the problem with the transplant centers. So say you come to HUB and you have your evaluation and you bring your daughter with you and your daughter was in who has it. So then you, you decide to go into this kidney care donation program and all of a sudden a match comes up. But that match says that your daughter has to go to Detroit, Michigan to donate the kidney. So not only does it come to you, you're going to say, mm -hmm, just don't you're going to be here in Pennsylvania having surgery, 
Your daughter's going to be in Michigan having surgery. Your wife's not going to know where she should be at that moment. And your transplant center, they worry about these donors, trust me. You know, they want to make sure that that surgeon in Detroit is going to take as good care of this donor as they were here. They want to make sure that their ability to do that laparoscopic surgery is as good as it is here at the University of Pennsylvania. They want to know how many procedures were done. They want to know, you know, and just a few years ago, we weren't going to transport kidneys because in New Jersey, the center I worked at, we worked with one of the, the um, pair donation, and, and they had these conference calls, and there was a match. And our surgeon was there, and it was like 4.30 in the afternoon, and. You know, at this point, they were trying to get to figure out these loan matches, and they said, now, the resolution could be, this donor won't travel. If we can put this kidney in an ambulance and take it to the airport, and my wall said, I'm going home. He took his coat, and he left, and that was it. He wasn't even going to discuss it. We weren't going to transport these living donor kidneys. People were coming through with this wonderful gift, and we weren't going to jeopardize it at all. So everything evolves. Here we are two years later saying, well, you know what? We can get all these people transplanted if we do this. And if we can regulate the travel of these kidneys, and if we can save these patients from being exposed to this, then maybe we should try it. So, you know, we have come a long way. But they do worry about the donors. I mean, that's the, we had a match with someone up in um, Massachusetts at, he was at uh, Deaconess at the field. So we have two people, two women at our center, and they were both very close to dialysis and ready to go last July when we did an internal swap um, exchange. And we didn't hear from the center up in, in New England. We didn't, so we called New England Morgan Bank. He said, where's the support area? They're not coming back to us. Who's this guy going to donate? What's going to happen? So they, they kind of hemmed involved. And, and the bottom line was he found out toward the end that it probably wouldn't be the best thing, that his wife wasn't going to support him if he had to. And, and I found out after, you know, and I'm in this job and I was up there. Pretty much when they told that donor he had to go to New Jersey to have his surgery done, he said, where? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because they were coming, you know, he was coming from this federal deaconess hospital in Massachusetts. And we tell him, you know what, you're going to the New Brunswick, New Jersey to have surgery. You know, I guess he started to think, you know, I don't think I want to do this. I don't think I can. And he said, you know, you got to bring somebody with you. Who wants to go have surgery and not have somebody go with you? Okay. You know. Can so. we make any really rough prediction? If this thing goes through, it's national in a year or two. How, what percentage can you think will be taken care of that need kidneys? So um, I would guess, if you look at those numbers, and it said, um, is it 16 daily transplants? I would say we'll easily do a daily one. That's a guess, and I would say that's a low well guess two years from now, if things proceed. But right. then things happen. What happened in the New Jersey raid? You hear that today? Huh. Yeah. yeah, I didn't get that working. Mayors and, and what happened? Northern Jersey, Rabbis, mayors, legislators. Well, I was born and raised in New Jersey. You know, somebody said to me, oh, did you see that there was a big raid in New Jersey? That I, I read the headlines. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, that's funny. Yeah. You know, so it's like, well, what else is new? But I didn't even read the article to see that this rabbi was But it was the rabbis in, in, in Brooklyn, New York, that were doing the trans more than one rabbi. Uh, yeah. They were selling. You know, so unfortunately, you just sometimes it just takes one big story or for like a national story, something along the lines of that. But I think it all will be shown. What's that? They were making a large profit. I, I just heard they were buying them for ten and selling them for one hundred and six. What, 160? But I didn't get the connection between the rabbis and the council people in Jersey. Well, they, the, the no. article, because I thought it was real estate and zoning for the council people in Jersey, so I didn't get the... I think there's a bunch of stuff coming out. There are two I different stories, but, actually. Now, the the mayors and the legislatures were taking bribes. 25,000 yeah, a year, 50,000 a year. Didn't have anything to do with the transplant. Right. Didn't have anything to do with the Only one of the 44 had anything to do with the yeah, right. right. the, the real question is, how could they get away with it? Not so far as the money, but so far as 
purchasing it and then delivering it to another party. How did, isn't there restrictions? Well, in the article rules? that I read, and um, they went uncovered, there was an FBI agent and a woman went undercover, and they said that it was a businessman and his secretary and that her uncle needed a kidney. And they went to this person and I guess this rabbi said to them, you do understand that it is illegal to buy an organ. You are not paying for their kidney. You are paying, you are compensating them for their time and their travel. <laughs> so that's how they sold it. And probably what they needed to do is, I mean, if they met this person first, when you go to the transplant center and you, you say, this is my friend, I've known him for 10 years, and you know, mm -hmm. they see the social worker and they go to the psychiatrist and they go to the, come on, let's face it, there are family members that don't speak to each other. You know, there are a lot of people that come forward with friends that are closer with them than mm -hmm. families are. You know, you can't, how do you dispute that? Like, how do you prove? So... <laughs> I think like homeless people is some mm. a while ago that people they were mm. picking their kidneys. I can't even have that girl was. Oh, there's always excellent. How about they do it? They sell it. That's another thing about cultures that they mention. A lot of people that have done wrong in their life and want to do something to make up for the wrong that they've done. Do they come forward too? Will that be accepted? Yes, and I would just say from my experience, not from statistics, but I've gotten involved in a call here and um, at the other center. Um, many times people who are recovering alcoholics mm -hmm. or drug addicts, mm -hmm. um, someone that spent some time in jail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone came to here, a family member needed a bone marrow transplant, and she was not compatible, and they had a big fundraising, and we found a lot of recipients, and the, the um, person that needed a bone marrow transplant went into remission, and she feels if she gives something back, then maybe you want to need that bone marrow transplant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't think she'll probably go through mm -hmm. um, Someone who just got out of the army called through, and um, just feels that it's his duty to end things before he gets out of, you know, leaves the service and goes on the next part of life. But I mean, yeah, there are people, some of them spend time in jail, you know, people that mm -hmm. are, as long as they're not, they are, you know, but that only is really serious. Or, or who has a, a spiritual awakening. Right. Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to mention, it's kind of funny when you were talking about the prepared donation. They had the exact same show on Ray's Anatomy. I don't think saw that it was everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. They were ready to have yes. this mm -hmm. well, kidney transplant, but people were backing out. Husband and wife started having disputes. It was really I didn't see that. And that's exactly what Montgomery said in the news thing. He said, we finally think Grey's Anatomy. And I said, oh, I guess I saw that. But it also <laughs> looks like there's a new program on for the fall. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Three Rivers or something. Yes. It's right. going to be really yeah. good. Yeah. And um, the transplant community, they're Donate Life America. They're in there consulting. It's uh, Hollywood Donate Life or something, and, and they ask they volunteer that if they ever use a transplant scenario in any movies or any shows, that they call them in first. And um, they're they're saying it's a great representation. This is supposed to be a great channel. So. I know there are situations where uh, someone could uh, redonate. In other words, if I received a great kidney and I was young, and but yet I had to, I got in an auto accident. Could that be redonated? No. No. How about if I was still alive? You know, I you could do that. Back <laughs> Not a kidney, eh? Other so organs. Part of the liver, yeah. They told us right. that it was right. cut and formed to right. the body and it, the way it was shaped. There was, a woman down down the, again. there was a woman down the shore who had received a kidney uh, pancreas transplant. Uh, she died of an aneurysm eight years later, and her family was told that her kidney was never to be back. That was uh, four years ago. And they told her? They told her her kidney and her liver was continually redone and redone and redone. That's what they're telling You guys put me in shame. <coughs> you know, more Sorry. than I do. <laughs> oh, he's got more. Get out the books. <laughs> Diane. Like I didn't have my you got more years in the business than you do. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that they should have been able to get more years in the business than you do. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that they should have been able to get more years in the business than you do. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that they should have been able to get more years in the business than you do. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that they should have been able to get more years in the business than you do. Yeah.
you have to die in a condition to be a donor. Right. Mm -hmm. The chances, the chances of that are from yeah. the one. That's like, like the one two percent, right? Right. Yeah. What I'm saying in her case, you um, died of anger. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the chief surgeon where I used to work, people would say, you know, if they donated a kidney, well, what if I got in a car accident? What, you know, what if I only had one kidney and I got in a car accident? You know, he said, chances are that if you're going to damage your kidney in a car accident, where it is. You're not going to come out with anything. You're going to die from the trauma that you, you know, because you know you work in the operating room. You know your kidney is very well cushioned and protected. And you're going to, there's that much trauma from a car accident. Your liver and everything else is probably going to be. I was curious about something. How many people in the medical profession are altruistic donors? I always wondered about that. What are you looking at me? Like, you know, I mean, you know, the transplantation. I mean, just I was curious about really, surgeons. Are they, are they I'll tell you. They, oh, so and, and I've been reading a lot, and you know, this is really just coming about. Like this past maybe six months, that people are saying, you know, what well, I could do this. And this is really happening. This is a, um, There was an article written. Um, you know, we get the news that, that they distributed through out the gift of life here. And a woman who was a writer needed a kidney, but she said that um, unfortunately anyone that came forward that wanted to donate a kidney is looked at as a suspect. Mm -hmm. oh. And that when she brought anybody in that was going to be tested to be a donor, the transplant centers looked at them as if, like, oh, so what's she giving you to come in here just to be? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you can't, and, and that whole aspect of it and that how we're looking at things really is turning I never thought about it until after we donated Alex's and it's because I was with him every single day for the three months he was in the hospital and seeing him went through with the testing to try to donate his organs and finding out that he was his organs were so bad but one kidney was able to get somebody out for dialysis. It made me think about doing and kidney for the people that are out there. But yet yeah, before then, I really didn't think about that. Mm -hmm. uh, just my grandson, you know, I think he was really great. And, uh, yeah. the, the more basic question is how many people in the medical profession are signed organ donors? Right. And it's very oh. interesting. I've had the opportunity laying an operating table to convince nurses that it really is worth doing and change their mind from the beginning of the operation to the end. Now, it wasn't one where you're under anesthesia, obviously, but uh, and we get in the conversation, you know, heart transplant, oh, wow, great conversation while you're waiting, mm -hmm. and you ask the question, are you an organ donor? Well, no, not really. Think there really, was why not? Less than the average time, you think? I don't know. I, I, I haven't got a survey, yeah, I'm just saying. There's a new law, and I know for sure it's in New Jersey. But I know it's in New Jersey from the New Jersey State Nurse Association. I just got a, a newsletter that comes out, and it's a requirement now that nurses have to be educated on organ donation. Oh, and New Jersey now here is New that. Jersey licensed, you know, you have to mm -hmm. do these continuing education things now. And how do they get that education? Well, there are different ways you can get it. You can either get it online, you have to go to a meeting, you have to go to an approved meeting for these CDs, but they're talking about how they're going to I would sure hope they got some recipients in that class to share. I was at Cooper Hospital three years ago during Donor Week, and the whole idea there was to get all the medical staff signed up at the organ The doctors that came by that one time were very enthusiastic about signing up to be done. A lot of the nurses, as soon as they heard we were doing, they hit that wall and as far away from yeah. the bus as they could yeah, go around. Yeah, Misery for you, too. <laughs> uh, uh, Cooper Hospital has one of the lowest, they have one of the lowest rates of uh, donation. I think it was at that time, it was about 30% of all the people that passed away at Cooper Hospital with that. You can tell by the medical staff they really need to have a big, you know, you know sense of why they should be that. I mean, we have representatives, we have hospital service representatives, we have people that are out in the hospitals now, you know, like stationed at, you know, a couple of the bigger hospitals, just to keep open communication, just to mm -hmm. make sure that, you know, the stories that you see here, like nurses moving up on. I'm sure that network has people, you know, 
Right. Mm -hmm. well, this interesting mm -hmm. to be there on command during the time <laughs> it was just I was just shocked how some of the people on medical staff that Well, and you know what? Some of it's old school and our, our offices where I used to work the neurosurgeons were right next door. And and you know what? Some of these doctors don't look at this. Like like these trauma patients that come in with this head trauma and this they take it as a loss. They weren't, you know, oh well, you know, I couldn't save this one. You know, they take it as a, you know, they can't save the patient and they can't you know, they consider it a personal loss, like a blow to their own esteem because these brain surgeons, I guess they don't know that, but you know, didn't save this one. You know, and, and they're like, Oh, I guess you should call the network or oh, I guess you should call the like it, it's really that's why they stopped those very same physicians. In doing a couple programs and speaking engagements with the trauma centers, especially the ones in the Frankfurt, three hospitals there, they seem because they don't do transplants that they have everybody on board in the hospital because they're looking at the different areas there to guide people to us. And there was something going on when we were there that day and almost had to stop because they had a donor there and they don't do transplants and they have people coming in that they want to direct and come in so that their program is proactive with the rest of the people in the hospital that work there. Right. You know, same thing for, for the, the um, coordinators. God bless the coordinators that work with the families. Oh, you know, this job, no. Mm -hmm. Amazing job. Oh, Incredible. Yeah. You know, that's one mm -hmm. thing I thought, you know, I, I never... But I used to like to have them come to the clinic. You know, once in a while they would come to the clinic. They get the flight yes. coordinators. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just in the middle of the night, I didn't matter what time I look at, I could see the coordinator TV sitting out at the desk. Yep. Like you know, there. and then they have downtime, like they work those funny shifts. Kind of. so yeah, then so somebody else. She, she was there, and then somebody else. Come over and tell me what you need to turn it on. Or if they're on here, come over to the telephone guy. You know, just come through. There's always going to be a patient there that you're going to walk away and think. Does anyone have any last question before we conclude this very interesting program? That was a great, thank you so much. If not, let me just say up front, Diane, often we have our speakers in as I was talking to you before, and I'm thinking to myself, how much can you say about explaining the program? You know, this may last half an hour, who knows, you know? We are now about an hour and 50 minutes into a very interesting program, which obviously we've been very attentive to based on the questions you're asking and sharing the experience you have. And even if you never have to face the need for a kidney transplant, as we often advertise these programs, you walk away with an education and you are the magnets that draw people into you when they have questions about transplantation. And now you are more equipped, through Diane's sharing, to be able to answer some of those questions with facts or if you don't remember or you didn't pick up that fact, to say, you know, I don't know, but I know somebody who does. And you don't have to remember her name. You don't have to remember anything she said. You can call Gift of Life and say, I need to talk to the person that's responsible for that, that kidney program down there, the paired kidney or whatever it was, and they'll put you in touch with her. And then you can get the factual answer and get back to that person. In that so. regard, Tom, would the presentation points be available online or something so we can have those? If so Diane approves, I can put them up on a website and I'll get that information out to you. Uh, what I will do along with making this one of the TRIO programs is give you a copy of that program so you can use it any way you see fit, since it's your program certainly, and it will be on a disc 
and uh, yeah, those slides, if you want to, well, I've got electronically. There's a couple of people have asked who couldn't make it, could they have materials, mm -hmm. and when a presenter makes them available, as we've got now, I can email them that to you. So do you make sure I have your email address, Joe? Mm -hmm. I do. Never mind. Mm -hmm. I do. I'll send it to you, uh, and a couple other people have asked for that, so I can okay. do that, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Is, we're going to keep track of what's going on in this pair exchange, and um, can we be in touch with you or sure. it, or the website, or um, we want to stay on top of this program? You can call me. Okay. If you just call me, you know I don't have to do this, but if you just call me, I'll take the email you like. address and Absolutely. I'll email you tomorrow. Um, the email address is always first initial, last name at right. donors1.org. Right. Real easy. Diane James. That's true. Right. Okay. Anytime. Or if you call the front desk, they can put you through. But absolutely. But I can tell you that um, the email address is first initial, last name at donors1.org. And you can also call the front desk at 2000. But of reported centers that reported to UNOS, kidney transplants that occurred, 526 transplants have occurred so far that are reported through kidney pair donations, in other words, through swapping kidneys. We still question, um, my, one of my bosses here says, I still think that number is wrong. <laughs> because that's a lot of transplants that are happening. But that's what's reported in the data. Here in our donor service area, 22. And that's it. So we really need to get a move on. We can do a lot more here than we've been doing. 22 so this since 2000? Mm -hmm. No. That? Mm -hmm. No. Reported kidneys for and that's because yeah, that's kidneys. 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 But there were well that's because kidneys. of swapping kidneys. kidneys. And part yeah. of the reason it why we haven't done it is since 2000. 2000. For since 2000. UNOS is now stepping in to start a pilot program. I have that. Um, and part of the reason why they couldn't do this was because of NODA, and NODA is the um, National Organ Transplant Act that was passed in 1984. And in 1984, um, I guess it was 73 that Medicare, they said the government would cover patients that needed dialysis. Because in 1973, and that wasn't that long ago, there was actually a council or a list of people that needed dialysis. And if you didn't have the money to pay for your dialysis, then it went to a committee, and the committee selected who would get dialysis in the room. And I just think that that's devastating. So in 1973, it was Jimmy Carter, who was president at the time, that signed the, the law that went into effect that said Medicare would cover patients that needed dialysis. Little did they know how many patients that was going to be. You know, here we are 25 years later. Um, the story also goes that there was a distant relative cousin of Jimmy Carter who needed dialysis and wasn't selected. 
mm -hmm. pay for it. So I mean, you know, when the issues come close to home. So that was in 73, but in 1984, in early 80s, cyclosporin was first um, discovered, and they were starting to do transplant, and the government said, you know what? If we're taking care of these patients and we're seeing patients that are on dialysis, then we really need to start looking at these organs that are being donated, and we need to make sure that everybody gets a fair shake. So they signed the National Organ Transplant Act, which said there would be a fair, that a, an agency or a group that was appointed by the government would oversee the fair and equitable distribution of organs. So in that, that long dissertation as well as our that came out, it said that there would be no valuable consideration given for an organ. And that's where the law came out, that you can't buy an organ and you can't pay for an organ and you can't. And that's exactly how it was awarded. There can be no valuable consideration for an organ. Well, there was a question as to whether swapping, and on here I don't like the word swap, but you know, they talked about organ swaps and they talked about exchange. You don't see that too much in these programs, that it's pair donation, because the word swap and for exchange kind of put a connotation on it that there was a, um, an amount that could be assigned to an organ, that, that it was being considered for consideration, you know, that it was almost that they were trading, you know, Hong Kong or something. It was a, so it wasn't until, and, and there were several issues that came out, but it wasn't until 2007, finally, that NOTA was ratified. And that was in this Charlie Norwood Act that said, um, you know, it, there was, it, it was okay to do kidney pair donations, to do that as long as it was equitable and it was overseen and it was fair and there were regulations to it. So the, the, um, I guess the proposal or a proposal of some sort, some sort to do an exchange of kidneys or to do a swap of kidneys has gone out for public comment twice. It went out first in 2006, it went out again, but, and that's before it comes into law or becomes made a rule, and then it was pulled back again because there were so many people that opposed it and said that it put a value on a kidney that you couldn't. So it wasn't until the end of 2007 that they finally said we could move ahead. But that's as far as UNOS goes. There were other transplant centers and other groups that moved ahead and did it because they were private groups. And they said, we don't think that that's true and we're going to do this. But that's what precluded it from being a national program because the government couldn't get in on it until they ratified that act. And that's what the delay has been. But this is a two-way exchange. And this is, um, I didn't go through the whole thing, but this is when there are two pairs that come forward. They're usually blood group A and blood group B patients. You know, um, I'm blood group A, my donor is blood group B. We're blood type incompatible. The opposite comes forward and we agree to swap donors. That's a two-way exchange. This is a three-way exchange and it's certainly on the same guideline. You know, there's three donors and there's three recipients and their blood types all match. And remember, it doesn't have to be blood type compatible. There are a lot of O patients out there who have been transplanted in the past or have received blood transfusions or women through childbirth have developed antibodies, which means that they could have family members and they could be a good match, but they could have antibodies which were preformed from either a prior transplant or that makes them incompatible. So this is a three-way. Now the new thing that we're working on and that really, and I think that this is what's going to help us, and this is going to be an answer, um, this is what's called the chain. Um, and for any of you that can't see around me that. And this non-directed, altruistic donor is where things are going to change, I think, I hope, in the country. And these are people that come forward and say, you know what, I want to donate a kidney to somebody. And it's happening. There are a lot of people across the country that are doing it now. As little as five years ago, we weren't even taking these donors at those centers. Many of them were calling. I mean, I was all called one night on a Saturday night, and, and the answering service called me and, as a coordinator and said, some guy called and said he wanted to give somebody a kidney. I said, no. They said, anybody. So I said, all right. They gave me the number. I called him back. He obviously had been out on a Saturday night at the time, and he said, boy, you people have strange hours. I said, you called me. <laughs> I didn't initiate this. He said, well, you know, I feel like I want to help somebody. I said, you know what? Here's my number. You call me Monday morning, and I'm going to set you up to do this. You know, and he never called back. So there were a lot of people that really didn't come through. Well, the reality is, they are now. There are a lot of people that are willing to donate. Um, so when, when an altruistic donor or someone, a non-directed donor, which means they want to give their kidney, but not directly to a specific person, just to someone waiting on the list, if they say that they want to get into this paired exchange program, they have the opportunity to maybe, perhaps, probably, make 
more transplants happen than just that one. And here's how it works. So an altruistic donor comes forward and says, okay, I'm going to donate my kidney. They test their blood type, they test their antigens, everybody here knows their HLA. And they match them with a recipient. Well, recipient A's blood type B, if we say from the last pair that we saw, and their donor, their donor is blood type A. So if the non-directed person donates to them, then their donor then gives to the next person who's blood type A, which would be the second group that we talked about. This donor from recipient B, donor B, who's blood type B, can then donate, and here's why it's called the closed chain. This person then can donate to somebody that's on the waiting list, and that closes the chain. So rather than one person getting a kidney where an altruistic donor, a non-directed donor comes forward and say, calls a transplant center and says, I want to give a kidney to somebody, and they just pick somebody on the list or they run the list to see who they're the close match with, this way three people end up getting transplanted instead of just one. And this is called the closed chain because it goes to someone on the waiting list in the end. How many groups can be in that chain? They're, they're changing the name, but in this slide, you see this is what's called an open chain. And this is the newest concept, and they're called bridge donors. This starts the same thing. Um, let me just, so this, this starts with a non-directed donor that comes through. All right. Now those past surgeries that I just showed you, the last three slides I guess I neglected to say, is that those surgeries take place at the same time. And that's where, let me go back, that's where sometimes there are issues. It doesn't need to be in the same center. It can be across the country. It can be anywhere. But this, um, I don't want to go through the whole thing, but the two-way exchange and the three-way exchange are all simultaneous kidney transplants. And what happens is everybody goes to the OR the same day, and everybody initiates anesthesia on the three donors at the same time. There are calls from the operating room saying, okay, we started. And then when there's first incision, they call and say that we started. So that all three donors are gone at the same time. And the reason for that has been, and always been, so that no one will renege or change their mind and say, I don't want to do this at the last minute. Mm -hmm. There is no valuable consideration that we just talked about. There is no way to coerce someone into doing this. And no matter what, patients can decide up to the last minute and say, you know what, it doesn't feel right. I don't want to do this. You can't hold them responsible. So, so that no one would be left without a kidney in the end, these operations had happened at the same time. Well, it's a big deal. We did just a two-way exchange at my center, and we had to do it. Really, the only way we were able to pull it off was because in July, a lot of the surgeons, we did it um, last July, surgeons were on vacation, so we had the availability of the operating rooms. Many centers will just need two operating rooms because they'll keep the kidney in cold store, you know, in that cold ice for a little bit while they change the room over. In other words, they, they re-sterilize everything and they do. We weren't able to do that at our center because the anesthesiologists weren't cooperative. But so we had to have four rooms reserved. Well, you know, that's hard. And we also needed four surgeons to be available to do the transplants. If you have this, this is six rooms. You need six rooms. You need six surgeons. You need them available. And you don't know what's going to happen once you get in the operating room. There's no saying that this is going to go from you until the end. And that's how it's with a closed chain that they're all at the same time. This, they don't occur simultaneously. And this is where I, my faith in people who restored it, I love what I do that. But, so you have this non-directed altruistic donor that comes forward, and, and it follows the chain in the same way that, that the last did. They donate to some of them, the kidneys go down, donor recipient. What happens, though, is, see the light blue donor and cluster two, where it says cluster two? That's called the bridge donor. That ends that chain, and that donor then begins the next chain at whatever point they can get the maximum number of transplants performed. So you know what the amazing thing out of all of this is not just the people that are doing it, it's the computer programs that can determine all of this because apparently it's like this phenomenal gym, I'm not doing that to you that <laughs> to put all this data in and, and to be able to run these computer programs and find these people. The question was this bridge donor that was going to be left out there. And this paper was written a few years ago, what would happen? How many of these people would commit and say that I'm going to give a kidney, but when their loved one or their, their intended recipient that they were incompatible with already had their kidney, how many of these people were going to say, you know what, I don't think I want to do this anymore? Mm -hmm. So far there have been none. All right, and there have only been a certain amount. I was going to put, there's a video clip on the website, but um, 
where they did like 14 people, it's a couple different clusters in the chain. So the second cluster starts and then the third cluster. I mean, they could go on just without never ending. And I don't see the relationship between cluster one and cluster two. It seems like cluster two can exist all by itself without no, cluster It can, one. But, but only if that donor is available. Cluster two can't start, and I don't have my point. The, the, the recipient and donor are connected. See, the, the, yeah. the yellow. The yellow and the blue? Right. Oh, I and see. And it's, a pro and it's a promise. So like a husband and wife kind of thing. Key, that donor doesn't donate. I see. Diane, okay. the button on top is a pointer. Oh. Oh. That's so it could stop right here. I and mean, this is where the next chain starts with that mm -hmm. donor. Here's, here's the luxury, though, in this, that just in case, or, or the fail safe, I guess I should say, that someone doesn't come through on this, if this donor were to say, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore, it would stop right here. And no one got left without a kidney. None of the, the transplants below that would have taken place. But no one would have gotten left without a kidney. Where in the last that we saw, like the three-way exchange where there's three donors and three recipients, if one of those donors were to back up or would not back out and not be able to do it, then somebody got left without a kidney. So this leaves where everyone got a kidney, and then they could start a next chain with the next donor that comes through. So this, no one would be left without an organ. These operations don't have to take place at the same time. Well, UNOS is stepping in. The question is, how long do you leave these donors out here? So there's a proposal now for this UNOS program that's supposed to start in September. And the regs are going to be that these bridge donors, that once they're approved, it's out for public comment now, will be given three months. So they're going to run a computer program once a month. And if in three months, this bridge donor that's out there um, doesn't match or start another chain, if they don't match with anyone to start, then they're going to give them the option of donating to someone on the transplant waiting list. So then that way they don't have to be that long without it. If they decide that they're okay and they want to wait a little bit longer, in addition to their transplant center that brought them into the pool, then they can go for another three months. Yeah. At six months it ends. At six months, you're going to ask that person to donate to the, to the deceased donor list to the next best match person. Why? You all right? Uh, no, you made a comment. I thought you were going to say no. They shouldn't. <laughs> no, I, I, it's just, it's very it's very interesting. Well, yeah, because people are doing it. This is just another look at it, and this okay. was from one of the pair donation programs out there. This is actual. This is the result. This happened. Of a match. Oh. These were forty-one Spider -Man. pairs. All right, there's eighty-two little dots up there, and these were all the matches that were possible. Awesome. Once they checked all these and went through, and I didn't put the slide in there because it goes through this long drawn out thing how one person did, ended up receiving a kidney, one donor ended up getting pregnant, she wasn't able to donate, another donor was in a car accident, hurt her back, and it goes through the whole thing. Oh, oh, only three, three transplants, were, one, mm. two, three, were able to be performed out of that. And that just shows like the intricacy that goes into it. Because even though the computer program can name all these matches mm -hmm. and say that, a match is big. When you add personalities and when you add individuals into it, mm -hmm. and you add, you know, the stress that it adds to people, or you tell them that, you know what, we found a match for you, but they're in California. You know, that's what changes things sometimes. And then again, the donors can always, in the end, not go through. So these chains always have to start with an altruistic donor. Yes. <laughs> this is another way of looking at it. Pays if they're not all in the same hospital, and in fact they're a distance away. Who pays the, uh, and I'm assuming that the donor is the one who's doing the, the traveling. Um, who, 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 pay, who pays the donor. that? If the donor has to travel, the person has to travel, then that expense has to, the donor has to pay that expense, mm -hmm. or you know the recipient can mm -hmm. insist with the travel expenses. There are some programs, there's a program down in Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, right now, the money that they have, you have to be almost three times the poverty rate to be eligible to get money, too. Believe it or not, though, since I got into this, um, there are a lot of airlines that will donate points and all to you for an airline ticket hmm. ahead. And this is where our, donor, our transplant house is going to come in. You know, if you bring someone in from out of town, they're bringing somebody with them. Mm -hmm. You know, when they could stay at the transplant mm -hmm. house and then bring them back and forth to the hospital. Will they ever fly in Oregon? That's what we're going to start doing. And that has recently just started within the past maybe a little over a year ago. 
Um, and that's part of mm -hmm. what our role as gifted life is going to be. Mm -hmm. Um, to transport the organs. They're but then you start them. losing quality in the organ, right? Well, studies show that up to 80 hours of cold time on a living donor order, organ, kidney, has not affected, um, you know, any function of the kidney, but the studies aren't long enough to even look, like in three years, they don't see any difference. But what, what happens to the simultaneous action of the chain? Uh, there's a, there's a, um, a recipient in Philadelphia and a recipient and a donor, and a recipient and donor in California. Mm -hmm. Okay, they operate, I guess, in, okay, so if the organ is traveling and not the person, they operate on the two donors cross country simultaneously. Okay, how about if there's a third that well, doesn't need the travel? See? Th that what happens so to the chain. <laughs> You know, how they can work it out, and I can tell you there has been a case where um, in New Jersey they did an exchange in New England, and what they were able to do there is they chartered a flight. They left, um, not Newark Airport, but one of the small airports in North Jersey. So the kidney came from St. Barnabas Medical Center in North Jersey. They had it to the airport in like less than 30 minutes um, from the time it was taken out. It was on a charter flight. They took it up to New England. The people from New England were up there waiting. They took the kidney and they handed over the kidney that they had removed from the patient up in New England. They brought it back down to New Jersey and the transplants were performed. But but the New England donation had already started. They started at this. Um, the New Jersey one started first because of flight time and all that. But yes, because you have to think about it. They flew a kidney east from California, um, one group, and they must have flown. And that's how they know now that eight hours, more than eight hours of cold time, of time on the kidney didn't make any effect, but, you know, have any bad effect. But if you miss a flight, you know, if they're going to be flying commercial, you have to be able to work something out another way, and that's where we're going to come in here and get the life. Hey, that's what we do. Like Howard said yesterday, we were in Delaware. He said, you know, we've been flying hearts, and we've been flying livers, and we've been, we've been doing it for 35 years. Mm -hmm. You know, if anybody can do it, they can find the flight, and anybody can get it, then we're going to go. But here's a new twist to it. So we had a meeting here about a month ago, and Bill writes me from the New Jersey Sharing Network spoke. And, um, you know, um, Rick and Howard here said, you know, maybe we'll fly somebody with kidneys. Maybe, maybe we're going to, if, if they bring it, you know what I mean, if we're going to take a commercial flight, then maybe it would be worth it to have somebody that's going to fly with these kidneys, because we certainly don't want to go in with the baggage that... So Bill from New Jersey said, well, they looked into that, and guess what? The one airline wouldn't let them fly. They're going to have to go to the, what is it, the national airline thing? The um, Because of the liquid that the kidney is stored. Oh, my God. Okay? Oh, my God. I thought, okay, More than three ounces? That? How about that? More than three ounces. And that's it. Your mom had to carry it on the plane? <clears throat> so um, sure. is it the, I forget the, Come on, investigate all the plane crashes. They're going to have to go to them to see if they are there. So, yeah. you know, you, you never know. But, so there's a, as soon as you, it's like, you know, two steps there's forward and three steps back. But at least we're, we're getting those two steps forward. We're really moving forward. Mm -hmm. And this is a little hard to say. I took it from another presentation. But this is a, kind of a neat way that shows how these chains that, you know, certainly I think in mathematically there's an advantage. When you have three donors and three recipients in, in just a three-way exchange, you have to find these people, like the, the needle and the haystack, that all match each other. If you start with this non-directed donor, you really only need, these are recipients, the first row of circles that go down there. So you need to find a recipient that matches, but you need to find the next segment of the chain, which is their donor that matches a recipient. You don't need to make this chain six patients long when you find it. You know what I mean? It's not, um, so even though these many people will match, you don't, they don't need to match perfectly. You don't need to find these six people that match each other. You know what I mean? When you have the one, it, it's, it starts the domino effect is basically, there are more options. There are more people that don't match with this point with the non-directed donors. In the end, what this says, and the math is beyond me also, but it's um, the possible combinations. If you have 100 pairs times one, there's 100 combinations. You have 99 pairs, it goes up to 9,900. 
and it can go up to 10 billion pairs if we get so many you know, patients in there with this altruistic donor, it makes a difference. The more people that are in there, the more people that are in the group that you're trying to match, the more matches you're going to find. I mean, it's that easy, you know, that to say. So there are four programs out there right now that we're going to be working with until UNOS does take this over, um, and they do get a national program. They're all a little different. I'm not going to go through all the intricacies of each of them, but one of them is called Pair Donation. It's founded by Dr. Michael Reese out of Ohio. Um, the second is a national kidney registry, and this is in New York. It's founded by um, this gentleman's daughter named the kidney. Um, he's actually a Wall Street guy, and they're businessmen. They're not physicians and gamers from Carnegie Mellon created mm. their program. Mm. Um, you know, the people that know the computer. And their program is up and running. They have a lot of um, like time constraints and time, but they're doing a lot of transplants. The New England Pair Kidney Exchange, they're up in Boston, and, and we're probably going to be working with them. They were founded in 2002. Um, and then the last we'll be working with is the Pair Donation Network, and anyone who the Temple shirt on, um, Dr. Dollar is the chief of kidney surgery, I believe it's just kidney not all surgery at Temple, and he's very involved, he's like the vice president in this group. Hmm. So there are different, um, again, regs that go with this, but the point that I just wanted to bring out here that I bought this up is to show how good I have my plan. This group has 182 pairs entered into it already. They're probably not all active because people get sick, people on the waiting list don't stay active all the time. But this group has 182 pairs. They facilitated 32 transplants to date as of June of this year, and they had six chains in progress in June. This group in New York started in February of 2008. They did their first transplant. They have 150 pairs enrolled. They facilitated 44 transplants to date. They had 28 transplants and 16 chains that were in the process. So that's another 150 pairs. This group in New England has 141 pairs, 72 are active, there are only 50% that are active. Um, and they facilitated 40 transplants to date. Here's 200 pairs in this last group. They had 148 that referred for cross-match, that doesn't mean that they were all going to match, and 42 transplants have been performed. The problem with this that shows me the national program is if you add up all these numbers, there are over 800 pairs. And if we were matching them all to each other instead of in separate groups and separate computer, computer programs, then we'd be getting so many more transplants out of it. And that's what really, you know, we have to get everybody together and get this program running. The problem with UNOS is with any other government, you know, there's a lot of red tape. You're trying to get the regulations, you want to be fair. There's not always an answer of what the right way is. So on toward a national program, UNOS is scheduled to start their national program in September of 2009. And there it is. It's been a little slow start, but we're mm -hmm. trudging up the hill. Um, their process is going to be, and, and again, they're restricted, and rather than going through the whole thing, the length of their, the size of their chains or their exchanges are going to be limited to three pairs. There won't be six, there won't be nine, there won't be, there'll be three in each segment. I'll leave it to your own um, discretion to think about why they're not going to call them clusters, but they're going to call them segments. <laughs> They don't like the term cluster. So they're going to call them segments. And right now, they will not allow a non-directed donor into the system. Their computer program can't handle it right now. So right now, um, they're going to limit the pilot program to two to four groups. So it's probably going to be these established groups. Johns Hopkins in Maryland, anyone that's heard the news, Dr. Montgomery recently, they applied to be in this. So they, they'll probably be picked to UCLA is another one. Um, and their main computer program isn't even up yet. They're going to post the results to like a secure website and then they're going to run this match once a month. The rules are basic. Candidates, they must be registered on the deceased donor list. You have to qualify to receive a deceased donor kidney to get into the list, this list. But every recipient has to bring one donor with them, whether, you know, an incompatible donor either by blood type or by cross match. Donors have to be at least 18 years old. And there are now requirements of what has to go in for the education of recipients and donors, what has to go in agreements to participate of, of recipients and donors, and um, their written consent to participate. They're going to do 12 match months a year, so it'll be once a month along the program. Um, they are going to allocate the kidneys as far as the way that they allocate the deceased donor kidneys. Kids will have priority, pediatric patients. 
patients who have been a prior living kidney donor, if they ever need a kidney, that rule went into place a couple of years ago. You get what's the equivalent of four points or four years waiting time the day that you're added on the list, you get a priority. Patients that have a higher antibody level, greater than 80%, which means they're much harder to match, they're going to match them more frequently. They're going to add something extra, though, and that's going to be here. The points for matches between candidates and donors in the same center, the same donor service area, so that will be our gift of life. They'll get priority if you don't have to travel if you're in the same area or in the same region, and that would be our region, too, which includes Pittsburgh, New Jersey, and Delaware. Um, the current proposal, again, only allows living donors with one uh, um, incompatible donors, a recipient with only one living donor that's incompatible. Some of these programs will allow you to bring two or three people with you so that you can get matched sooner. But um, the altruistic donors have no way to get in. And there's a new proposal that's out now for public comment, and it's to allow these open and closed chains and to bring non-directed donors. If that happens, you know, rules are still saying all operations have to be simultaneous. So until they agree that they can do um, these bridge donors, or this is where it's about the three different cycles and the three different, but we're moving forward. I mean, at least it's progress that they're going to start this program. The good thing for us, and again, is which way is the best way, you know. The good thing for our patients right now is that UNOS isn't telling these other groups, the group in New York that's already doing this and the other, they're not saying that you have to stop doing what you're doing. They're saying keep transplanting as many people as you can while we're trying to get this up and running. So that's a good thing. So people want to know why are we getting into this? Well, here we go. The Living Donation Program, it's to increase the number of all organ donors, including the compatible, incompatible, and non-directed, altruistic kidney donors. Um, to increase the number of transplants performed within our donor service area. The other thing is to provide education to patients and donors, the public, transplant, and other medical professions professionals on the significance of organ donation, those living and deceased, so that donation is viewed as a fundamental human responsibility. That right there is a quote taken from the mission statement of Gift of Life OPO, and it's been in there 35 years. So we're just following what we said. The other thing is the transplant centers don't have the staffing or the money or the, to go out and maybe do a little more advertisement or try and get this together. Because it's a lot of paperwork, it's a lot of phone calls, it's a lot of, you know, um, back and forth. So here our goal, our primary goal, is to work collaboratively with the participating kidney transplant centers in the donor area to facilitate kidney care donation and increase the number of transplants performed. And what we're going to do is offer educational programs to support groups, try to get involved with the NKF. We're going to facilitate the non-directed altruistic donor inquiries. So now when people call, and, and since I've been here, I've probably screened five people that have called, and probably I would bet you two of them are going to come through. Um, people that called them for one reason or another want to donate an organ. It's recently come in the news of the service, people that um, have been in the Army or, you know, the government workers, uh, that they want to push for them to be organ donors and that they'll be covered because they get medical services through the VA. And there was, I don't know if anybody saw it, it was in the New York Times and it was on the news, that they did one of these chains and um, somebody out on the West Coast, I believe she was from California, she was probably 33 or 34 years old, was retired from the Air Force donating the kidney. And, and she thinks it's part of her service to her country, she doesn't agree with that. Now, your insurance pays, I mean, like if you're a donor, donor like altruistic or whatever, your insurance now, Congress? and here's the thing why all the transplant centers are coming on board. And I'll go through. Um, we're going to enter data. <coughs> we're creating uniform documents, policies, um, consent forms, and all that for the 15 transplant centers if they want to participate. We're going to get ready and we're going to review the, the statistics when they do the, run these computer programs and get the results. We can coordinate prepares to meet after the transplants occur. Um, we can do some review, feedback, and quality assurance. And the last thing, and there's only one center in the country that's doing it so far, and that's down in Texas, and we're already working on it, is we're going to work with Medicare to get what's the standard acquisition charge. And we are going to, um, if Medicare cooperates, and they have so far down in Texas, this gift of life will become a third party, party payer, will become a guarantor to pay for those evaluations of people that come forward and don't have an identified recipient. And how that works is then that billing can go on to Medicare because the fact is, of people that come forward that say they want to donate a kidney, 
The group in New York has had over a thousand people register at their website to say that they want to donate a kidney, and about three percent of them come come to fruition, really <coughs> come to transplant. The program that's in Ohio, they've had 750 people register at their website and say that they want to donate a kidney, and the same, it's been about three percent that really do are eligible and do go forward and donate a kidney. What that means is when the transplant centers work up donors who don't have an identified recipient because the recipient pays for the donor's evaluation, mm. it costs the transplant centers money to work up those donors. Because the recipient, if they have commercial insurance, they're not going to pay. You know, Cigna or, you know, here Blue Cross isn't going to pay for a donor that's not compatible because that transplant might not ever happen. So the transplant centers right now, more and more of them are doing it, um, are paying for the evaluations. And what happens is they get paid back on a case, to, on a center to center percentage ratio. It can be as low as 50%, they'll get back in the end from Medicare. It can be as high as 85%, one of the centers in our area. And that depends on what your patient care mix is, a commercial or Medicare, if it's in this medical. And you're talking about the evaluation. The evaluation. The actual surgery. The actual surgery is always paid for by the recipient's insurance. Mm -hmm. But once you've been identified in the match and they find a recipient for you, mm -hmm. then, then they know who to bill. But to get you into the system and to get your name into the computer base and, and get that testing done to make sure that you're an eligible donor, here at Gift of Life, we'll become the guarantor for that. And what happens is we report that to Medicare at the end of the year because Medicare wants patients transplanted. I mean, that's the bottom line. They know patients are going to live longer, but the bottom line is it's cheaper. It's much cheaper. cheaper for analysis. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you know those numbers, I forget what it is, but after the first year, after 12 months of having a kidney transplant, by five years, it's it's even, and then they're saving money, you know, from that to that point on, because dialysis is so expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so they want patients to have a transplant. And it's currently 2.3 years of dialysis is equal to the cost of a transplant. Right. So, hmm. you know, and then after a couple of years on That's dialysis, they start enough. having complications, the graphs start back, so we're working to do that, and, and that really is, um, and how that will work is we're going to pay for those evaluations, but when a living donor transplant does happen and comes through the exchange program for Gift of Life, then the recipient transplant center is going to have to pay a fee, a standard acquisition charge, and they do that now for the organs, you know, for us to go through doing the workup and all of that. Um, and, and, and this is appealing. It, it's got some of the uh, finance people, the hospitals, and treat. You know, in the end, it's probably going to cost Medicare some money. And, and you know, whether they figure that out sooner or later. Here's where we are right now: our action steps. And we're going out to the transplant centers. We had a meeting here a month ago, and every one of the 15 transplant centers, well, all but one of the pediatric centers, was represented. Where they sent someone here. Most of them, either by their administrators or, or their transplant surgeons, came. Everyone's interested. They want to get these transplants performed. So they are out there, and they want to work with us. Um, we want them to identify their incompatible pairs. What we're going to do is create uniform documents, consents, and it'll be up to the patient and transplant centers which of those four programs they want to get into. If you want to get into the to the um, pilot program, the test program from UNOS. Um, and then decide what they want us to do for them. They are transporting kidneys. That thing's really getting over my nerves. They are <laughs> transporting kidneys um, if they're willing to do it in the area. And it'll be decided on a case-to-case -case basis. So if you have, so say I'm at Hahnemann, and my recipient patient there, there's a donor that matches out in California, and that donor's 60 years old, and their kidney is good, but it's not great. And my recipient here, this is their third transplant, and as the chief of that program there, as the transplant team on a whole, they can say, you know what, we don't want this kidney to travel. It's just a higher risk case, we don't want this kidney to travel. Where in that same vein, if I'm a surgeon at, at say, Hahnemann again, and you know, I have this patient that has a history of polycystic kidney disease, has no heart disease, no high blood pressure, um, you know, is 28 years old, and there's a donor on the West Coast, that's the equivalent of a 30-year-old that, then maybe in that case, they're going to say, you know what, we can fly this kidney. We can fly this kidney because this recipient probably, you know, statistics show aren't going to have a lot of complications or aren't going to have a lot of problems. And it's a younger kidney anyway, so 
those things will be able to be decided on a case-to-case -case basis. And, and that's where your patients and your donors are going to come in. If the donor says they want to travel, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine also. You know what I mean? That, that will be their choice. If we get this into a national program and you think about it, you can put these restrictions in there and say that I'll travel the East Coast. You know, or I'll travel, you know, I don't want to go to California. Or the transplant centers can say, we don't want any more than three hours travel time on these kidneys. And then we look at it. Well, of course, the consent will say, you know, we're not going to be in control of catastrophic events or those other events that could happen, you know, if there's an earthquake or something. But um, I think it's new and exciting. I think that there are going to be a lot of transplants that come out of it. I think that we need to get it together better.